Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Agree or Disagree, the podcast. It is I, Kevin Olenek. And, of course, it is the end of the regular season for the Calgary Flames. As I mentioned in a previous podcast where I uh, challenged the owners uh, last week, this is the third straight season of no playoff victories. And this is the uh, final week of the regular season. So we're going to do a little bit of a Flames recap with the friends from fireside podcast we're going to talk a little bit about the restricted free agents we're going to talk about the recaps of the games that we have uh, this week the kings the blue jackets the oilers we're going to talk about mike smith's comments at the end of the oilers game uh what do we make of that we're also going to look at the restricted free agents this year and we're also going to talk a little bit about tree leaving and gullickson's future and the culture and dressing room uh and dan and matt from fireside podcast joins hello hey kevin so on our side this is dan alongside matt as always and we're joined by our friend kevin olenick uh he's going to be joining us for a special fireside chat this is a joint episode of our podcast and agree or disagree to the podcast welcome gentlemen welcome nice to be with both of you guys and uh, as always excited to talk flames hockey yes well, should we jump right into this and look at the week that was for the Calgary Flames? Let's do it. Uh, Monday night, late game. The Kings shut out the Flames to move into the first wildcard spot in the West. As always, the or I guess not as always, but as usual, lately, Flames not having a great showing and we're blank 3 nothing. Kevin, what did you think of this game? Uh, this was the... It, I felt like a funeral, Dan. It felt like the funeral march, you know, at that point where you're bringing the casket to the grave. That felt like this game. It was the same as everything else. They got a lot of shots. They had a lot of opportunities. They played okay. I might propose it, actually, I would argue that that was probably their best game this week. I know that it wasn't the one that they won, but I might propose it was their best game this week. And But ultimately, they just were out of gas, they were out of energy, they were out of confidence, and they knew their season was over, and the Kings took advantage of it again, and it was the way that it's been this month. Um, throw the puck at the net, take a lot of shots, make a mistake, and it goes cost three goals. Matt, Kevin, just describe this to LA game as the funeral march. What do you think of this one? Well, that's pretty much it. It's been emblematic of everything this past month and a half where the team gets in the right spots to do things and one problem happens and they just fall apart. And once again, like you have to get past... like We've run into good goalies, but that's after a while that gets to be no longer a valid excuse and the team just doesn't know how to face any adversity whatsoever. If you're a team that wants to be a Stanley Cup contender, you have to be able to beat good goalies. Exactly. Cause like, especially in the playoffs, you're going to be facing the best goalies period, especially as you, the further you go, you have to be able to beat them. And Calgary just has no answer right now at all. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think Matt said it well. You know, the Flames put themselves in position to do a lot of good stuff in this game. They started to, I think, play the way they needed to. And as we've seen happen, they faced some adversity. And I thought they just folded up and stopped playing halfway through. Yeah, that's it's been it's been the march of folding, really. It's been that's been what it's been. It's been throw the puck at the net. It's been shooting the puck, and you know something happens, and they just get distracted and. I, I don't know. It's just, it's really weird that for this team, for any team, I've not, I've never seen a professional sports team, whether this be hockey, football, or anything, respond the way that this team does in adversity. It's just weird. It's, it's almost like it, it's, 
it's almost like the 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 girl, the really pretty girl, drives by, and all of the guys are just staring endlessly, and they're distracted of what's behind them. It's just, and it's, or there's like a big fight, or it's just weird. It's it's inexplicable to me how this happens. Yeah, and, and I mean, we'll talk about this later when we talk about the coach and what his future might be. But I think that's one of the things that we need to look at next year: is how do we make sure that's not happening mentally with this team? Yeah. Well, let's move on to the next game. The next game was the Blue Jackets and the Flames, and Pierre-Luc Dubois recorded his first career hat trick. We had a milestone, I guess, in this game. The first goal is a flame by Chris Stewart, the probably the flame who's played the least this season so far. But, of course, didn't help anything, and the Flames ended up losing 5-1 to one to Columbus. Kevin, what were your thoughts on this one? Uh, this was one of those, I mean, it was congratulations for Matt Stajan getting his silver stick. Uh, his plum for his 1,000th game. Uh, this came two issues um, to me. Uh, it was not a good game for John Gillies, really. I thought he didn't have a very good game. Uh, this was also the game that they lost Travis Hamannick. Uh, and one of those things, they got a lot of shots on goal and nothing necessarily for it, but I really didn't feel, and even Gullitson said it at the end of the game, that this was the game that they didn't have a lot of emotion, and they it really felt like it was the end of the year, it didn't really matter, uh, all of that. And it just, yeah, it was emblematic of a team that was in preseason, postseason mode. And I think the biggest concern that I took away from that is um, and something we'll have to talk about in autopsy time, what do you do with this backup goalie position? Because to me, I don't think John Gilly showed enough this year to say that he's NHL ready. He's also a rookie. Yeah. He's a young goalie. Goalies often take a while to mature. Yeah. Do you think that David Riddick has looked that much better? Uh, I think he's looked a bit better. But I think it was very clear when Smith went down that Riddick couldn't handle the ball either. So I do think that I'm not entirely convinced that we have a goalie at this point that can back up Mike Smith. I don't think Riddick showed he was ready to be a starter. I thought he was fine as the backup. I thought he, when he came in and backed up, it was great. But when the pressure was on and the chips were on the line from Feb the mid-February to mid-March, I don't think that Riddick showed enough. Well, I guess the question there becomes, do you feel like in that case you would, and we'll talk more about this later, but do you feel like in that case you would want to go out and get another, I mean, almost like they did with Eddie Lack, get another veteran goaltender to be your backup? I think it's something you kind of have to consider in some ways. Um the I thing is then stalls everybody's development, right? Because then like Parsons stays in the E and nobody moves forward. I think you either have to trade one or promote one so that everybody sort of plays musical chairs up the depth chart. Well, I think that Gillies, I will think, I, I think that Gillies, I don't think one of them is back next year. I, I will say that. I think one of them will be one of the guys that will have to move because you're going to have to, if, if you want a, a solid top six forward, which is the biggest, or you want a forward, which is the biggest need on this team, you're going to have to move some pretty heavy prospects. Uh, and it may not be such a bad thing for Riddick to stay one more year in the minors and you bring in a veteran backup. Uh, I don't necessarily think that... I think that Eddie Lack was in a... I think an Eddie Lack, in a sense, was an anomaly because... I think there was a lot of problems with him coming into this team that he wasn't ready. Yeah, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Locke himself, but I mean, they went out there to position themselves with a depth one, two, right? And if Locke was where he should have been, it would have been a good number two. Sure, but he wasn't where he was. So I, I, I'm con like, my point with, with that would be if Riddish isn't ready, I don't think that you're necessarily bringing in a veteran isn't necessarily stunting development. It's helping development because I think it's quite likely that you're trading Gillies in the off season in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about RFAs, but I also think that it might be hard to convince say Riddick to come back. If you're going to put a veteran in at the NHL level, you might be more willing to just say, well, let's go back to Europe. Maybe. Uh, 
but you could also bring him back after a year of Europe. Is he a guy that a lot of NHL teams are, if you don't bring him back, is the NHL going to be hunting him down? I'm not entirely no, convinced I, of that. I think that uh, Parsons takes that job then, and I don't know if there will be room for him. Fair. Uh, but he hasn't, like, that month, that one month from the mid-February to mid-March when he was number one, when Mike Smith wasn't around, he, I mean, I know it's new. I know he's new, but I also, he he didn't stand on his head. And I'm not saying Mike Smith stood no, on his he, head. But if you look at, I mean, you look at the backup who plays, what, once every 10 games? And he played probably how many, 10 games in three weeks? So if you look at, you know, his performance, say one in every 10, is he doing good enough? Yeah, I guess. But is how many games do you want Mike Smith to play? Well, I think if you can rely on Smith for 60, I think that either Riddick or Gillies is good enough to do, you know, 20. I think I didn't... where Riddick and Gillies didn't shine is when they were being constantly worked at the NHL level. I don't think either of them is ready for a starter job yet, which is what we were asking them to do during those two weeks. Yeah, but you can't count on Smith not being healthy next year and being completely healthy in the entire year. He's no, thirty. He's right. going to be thirty-six or thirty-seven. So if you're going to have that question, you, you, the question really is: Is can Riddich and Gilly play, Gillies play thirty games in the NHL? And I don't. I definitely don't think Gillies showed thirty games. I well, think we're just talking about uh, Gillies and how he looked in the Columbus game. What do you think? Do you think that Gillies is ready for an NHL spot next year? If the team in front of him is playing at basically an NHL level, which frankly they haven't been for since January, then sure, he could probably play 20, 30 games without being... It, it's not like he's like Curtis McElhinney or any of the other insert random flames crappy backups from like the last... Like, is he the ideal guy? No. But, like, if you look at um, in Winnipeg uh, with Connor Hellebuck, for example... Uh, he was downright terrible for the first couple of seasons that he had partial games in the NHL level. And then now he's performing at the level that his potential showed. And sometimes you need to learn on the job at the NHL level. And I think Gilly's getting a little bit of action here and there this season helps, and I think having him play a little bit more consistently next year, like I'm not expecting him, if he does get the backup job, to put up stellar numbers. He'll probably be a middling backup in the NHL, but you're hoping that with these games, that once it is time to move on from Mike Smith, that you have somebody who is ready to go and can play at an elite level when the time actually matter now yeah i i think you know there's multiple ways we can look at this i'm and i think we're all going to defer on our opinions here but i would be w willing to give one of those guys the job and have them lose it i'd rather bring one of them in and say look you're not doing a good job so now you got to go out and bring in a ufa you know veteran then not give one of them that chance to at least seize the job yeah, fair. I mean, I think it's going to have, depend a lot on what the off season happens. I mean, you're not. I don't think your the Flames' priority is getting a UFA backup goalie on July first. I think no, that you can you wait. Those kind of guys, there's always one or two left. You know, yeah. September first. Yeah, um, but and it's something you can certainly solve later on in the year. Uh, but I just, you know, I think I, I I'm more concerned about Gillies and Riddich. For some reason, I, I feel like Riddich has played like I don't have like huge concerns with Riddich, but I do also wonder next year if we can really rely on Mike Smith for 60 games. I think the other thing to remember, too, Kevin, is I mean, Gilly's a year behind in his development because he lost all year to injuries. So I That's think true. If you look at where they're at. He's the younger goalie as well, and he's lost a whole professional year. Yeah. Yeah. But the expectation on this team isn't just get into the playoffs. This expectation on this team is to be at least a home ice advantage. And I don't think that that's, that's, I think when you're looking at that, I think we have to have hopefully quality goaltending all season. And I don't know if Gillies is ready for that, 
But as I said, Matt, I don't know if Gillies is is on this in this organization next year. I think it's a reasonable chance that he's one of the guys that they they move to get that forward. Yeah, and I could see that. Yeah. And Matt, and I've said that for a while. I and I, I mean, we don't know which one, but we think one of those two won't be here next year because yeah. you deal from a place of strength. And right now, one of the Flames' places of strength is goaltending. Yeah. Yep, goaltending and defense got too many and, of each, and and I think the Flames really want to move Parsons into an AHL job as well. Yep. Well, let's look at the last game of the week. This was a special game for one Flames prospect because he got to make his NHL debut against his hometown team, and that's Spencer Fu, who suited up for the Flames. They broke their seven-game losing streak and ended up beating the neighbors from the north, the Oilers, with a three-to-two win. Uh, this was an exciting game, especially in the third period. We saw some rough stuff with Lucic and Smith. Uh, Matt, why don't you start off with your thoughts on this game? I thought that this probably would have been game number eight in a row, if not for the unusual atypical per- bad performance from Cam Talbot. I think that two of the goals, at least, he should have had. But, you know, when your goalie is having a bad night, goals like that happen and the flames capitalized i don't think that the flames were the better team in the game when is the last time that al montoya has looked better than talbot i know it's like bizarro world i expected they put montoya in and they should have just played with a six skater because i thought we'd probably light him up for at least four more <laughs> uh yeah i just I, I agree with matt i thought talbot struggled early uh Smith allowed that uh, was that unfortunate giveaway, and then yeah, the Hathaway goal for sure was a bad one. The, that was the one that was like absolutely horrendously bad. Yeah, I mean Hathaway even looked shocked that that went in the net. Uh, like, oh, I scored. Yeah, hey, I guess. Now was that because it hasn't been for forty-one games, or is that also because it was a bad goal? I guess you can kind of like, a bit of both. Bit of both. Uh, but I really didn't. I know that they won, but I didn't think the Flames looked all that great, especially in the third period. I thought the Oilers kind of dictated the play a lot. Uh, and uh, but how many games have we had where we looked great and we lost? Like you know, you're going to get a bit of both. Yeah, yeah. I just I'm not. I don't know if we come away and just like, oh man, look, this team like took a step forward with this win. Uh, but. Um, it was a really good goaltending performance and a controversial performance overall by Mike Smith. Uh, but it, w- it was nice to see him play really well. Uh, he stood on his head, and I think that was part of the reason why they won. Yeah, I, you know, I think to me this was an old school battle of Alberta. A lot of chippy hockey, a lot of guys with uh, you know high emotions. It's what we always expect when we play our neighbors from the north. And I think with two teams that really are in this for nothing more than pride at this point, it really let them play a bit of a different type of game and i thought it was a fun game to watch yeah and that it was for sure it was, a, it was nice to see some energy in the even in the building and to hear it in the crowd it was nice too matt any thoughts on uh, lucic and let's say his performance this game well i'm just glad that the oilers have him for another five years at like 6.75 million he, he is yeah he, like, we get annoyed when we have guys like Tanner Glass uh, playing, but, you know, at least they're getting paid the league minimum. And Lucic is looking more and more like he's he should be a fourth-line goon-type player, and that's what we saw in that game was just him gooning it up because he doesn't have anything left in the tank, I don't think. I saw somebody on Twitter who said before this game that, and I haven't done the math on it, but I guess the Oilers are paying McDavid and Lucic as much as we're playing Goudreau, Monaghan, and Bennett. Yes, I saw that too. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, somebody's math is off here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I mean, it's, I guess, I guess if you're an Oilers fan, I guess you're happy that Lucic showed some spark finally because he hasn't done that much all year. Too little too late, though. Way too late. Little too late. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, if it wasn't for Louis Erickson or Troy Brower, this would be a really, it still is an embarrassing signing, but it's probably one of the worst signings and magnified by the fact that Taylor Hall continues to dominate in New Jersey. You but, know, I know we don't want to talk a lot about Edmonton guys, but I think this is going to be a trend that we're going to see in the next couple of years. I think the Oilers are going to find it harder and harder to bring in new UFAs. Yep. I think they're going to have to overpay them by quite a bit to bring some of those guys in. So I think we're going to see 
more Lucic contracts in the next two, three years. Yep. Especially on the blue line. I mean, I could see almost, you know, them having to pay almost McDavid money if they want to even have a shot at someone like a Carlson. Yeah, I I think I think you're right. I think they're going to have to I, to do that, or they're going to have to make some pretty shrewd trades, uh, which hasn't been done really in Edmonton yet. But they're going to have to make some really shrewd trades to fill up their their needs, which are many. Anything else about this past week? Anybody wants to talk about? Was it there? Not really. Wasn't there some sort of comment that? Did you guys hear the comment? Which one? The Mike Smith comment at the end of uh, the Euler game. Why don't you it, say that for us so that way our listeners can know? Okay, so uh, basically Mike Smith at the end of the Oilers game, because it was him versus Lucic after Lucic sticked to Giordano, it was Lucic and Smith that got into the tussle. Then Tanner Glass got into the next. When Lucic gets out of, out of the box, Tanner Glass is the guy that fights Lucic. Uh, Lucic beat him flat, no question about that. And Smith said basically at the end of the the uh, end of the game that it was he basically put over Tanner Glass, saying this is a guy from the AHL that has worked his butt off, has been through the ringers here, and. Um, he's the guy that's going out and letting the team, putting the team in a fighting position and is fighting. And there's other, we need more guys like that. Some people took it, this as a shot and a call out of the rest of his teammates. And others were like, this is a little bit out of line and felt that this was an inappropriate comment. Uh, I kind of got into this, I, I got on overtime and I debated this with Pat, and I felt that this was something that kind of was needed a little bit. I don't know if it was necessarily a specific call-out on specific players, but it does feel to me that at times, this is a team that has been run over. Uh, I take it back, I look back at that Golden Knights game, and I know that Ryan Reeves' hit on TJ Brody was a clean hit. I'm not saying it wasn't necessarily not a clean hit, but you can't... That hit changed that game, and the Knights took over from there. And there was an opportunity to necessarily... The game was over. There was an opportunity for someone to stand up to Ryan Reeves, and nobody did it. And this was another opportunity to stand up to Lucic, and we didn't see a Michael Furland do it. We didn't even see a Garnet Hathaway necessarily jump in there, and you would think that those were two guys that would. You saw a guy being called up that has been a healthy scratch, has been hasn't been necessarily... He's not a core member of this team. He's not coming back on this team next year. He's the guy that jumps in on Lucic. So I, I kind of see where Mike Smith is going here. The core of this team, at times, I think there's something in this dressing room and this culture that I know the game, some would say the game has changed, but I don't think standing up for your teammate has ever changed. I also think, who do you look at on this team and say, well, this guy should be doing it? I mean, Furland, if he's a first-line winger, which where they've played him, you're not going to be doing that kind of stuff as a first-line winger. Maybe Hathaway, but, you know, this is Tanner Glass's job. Tanner Glass knows his job. He's not thinking, oh, I'm getting called up. Now I'm going to go score a bunch of goals with Goudreau. This is his role. This has always been his role. If you look at his career, that's his whole reason for being employed. So, why was he why was he dressed in the lineup to give him some toughness so to me that's just a guy who knew his role and did his job well i would have been upset if tanner glass didn't do it how do you feel matt well that's the thing it it, it made sense that glass did step up to defend the team but as kevin was saying this team has lacked some intensity throughout pretty much this entire season and you look at we have about half of the team is supposed to be truculent ish forwards guys like Brower even guys like Lazar have been known to throw hits and play a physical game you or even Hamanek Giordano like there's a whole bunch of them that you would expect to be able to somebody to step up and like last season and in years past a guy like Derek England would have stepped up. And I think that his loss to the Vegas Golden Knights was actually one of the biggest turning points in this flame season because we had no NHL regular guy 
who would actually stand up to somebody if they're out of line. And like if England was on our team against the Golden Knights, I think he would have stepped up to Reeves and said, hey, but we don't have anybody with that leadership in them to step up. And that, I think, is part of the problem in the the lineup is that there's, like, everybody's kind of like, oh, well, the next guy's supposed to do that. And nobody stepping up to say, hey, that's just wrong, period. I'm here. I'm going to do it. And that disconnect is part of the reason why there, it seems like that there's 20 players on 20 separate pages this year. And that's a large reason why the Flames have struggled. True. Yeah, and, you know, I know that people get upset that at Smith because he's had a reputation this year and you guys will know this better than I have, but he, he's come across a little bit this year, a bit snarky towards his teammates. This is, wasn't his first time. He's done that a little bit, a couple times before he called the team out against Columbus. And I think that there's a fair fine line of this debate of when to do it and when not to do it. But I also think overall, Mike Smith has the credibility to say something I think there's two things to think about here. This is a team, this is a guy that came here from a really terrible situation in, in Arizona where he had, they haven't been in the playoffs in umpteen years and they're, and he, and there's no signs of life. And I think him and Tree Living had a conversation with the hopes that Mike Smith would have an opportunity to, to play in the playoffs. And he's got to be frustrated. He's got to be like beyond frustrated the way that this season's going. He's 36, he's near the end of his career. He just wants him to have an opportunity to play in playoffs. And he's watching this team in front of him. And as Matt said, go 20 different directions. And it just feels like he's pulling his hair out. And I don't, so I don't mind the timing of it here. I think as the, at the end of the year, he's, he's putting something out there that there needs to be something in this dressing room that needs to change. If this was January, I think that there's a bit of a different tone. And I don't know if I like it as much. But I think this is the end of the year. This is kind of an exasperated time, and he's venting what he's seeing. And I'm okay with it. I don't know what you guys think of that, but to me, I don't necessarily have a problem with him saying it at this particular point in time. It'd be different if the Flames weren't playing like crap for the last two and a half months. Yeah. So, you know, the the Flames have been the worst team in the league since January. So, yeah, he, he has every right to be pissed. I think he has the right to be pissed, and then they all have the right to be pissed. I mean, Smith is not like he's been the only guy playing. He's had some pretty crappy games in there, too. But I think that, you know, that's what, to me, that's what you expect from a veteran guy. You bring in a veteran guy, you want him to be that outspoken leader, that guy who's going to, you know, call out the guys who need to be called out. And sometimes we all need that. Sometimes we need to have somebody say, you know what, you're right, I didn't play well enough. And I'm not sure we have that as much as we need to on this team. But it brings me to a bigger question I wanted to ask you guys. Uh, do you think this team has enough strong leaders? Like, I don't, th- from what I've seen, Gio is not, you know, a uh, really outspoken leader in the room or otherwise. If you look at some teams that are, you know, powerhouses in this league, they've got three or four guys like Smith, the guys who can motivate within the dressing room. I'm thinking maybe that's one of the big things the Flames are lacking, that strong veteran leadership. Matt, what do you think? Uh, definitely. And ever since the Flames lost to England, uh, I think he was one of the main guys that would bark at people. And losing him was like losing pretty much like the only main guy who would do that. And uh, I think that the Flames need to get a two or three guys that have that leadership ability, even if they're just mediocre fourth line, sixth defenseman type players. It, that doesn't matter. They just need more of the correct type of player and i think that the flames have had for lack of a better way of saying it too many immature players Hmm. personality wise guys like dougie hamilton who you know like it's fine to have guys that are loose but when you're having a lot of the team be that that's where you know you it's just you need guys to put those guys in line when you need them to and 
right now we don't have that and add a, that on with a coach that doesn't seem to have control of the room either and uh, this is what happens i guess Kevin, what do you think you know i've been i guess today as a recording this it, this is the day that the sedines announced a retirement and all day we've been talking about the conversation out here has been leadership and brian burke was on a radio station out here, and he said that the Sedins didn't necessarily invent the culture in this room. It was brought down from people like Naslin and Linden and Schmiel. And I think to me, when I heard that, I have to look back at the history of this organization and ask what this culture has been. I know that we want to saintize Jerome Aginla, but I also don't know... Like, in terms of a leadership, did he set a culture in this room? And what about before that? Like, have have we had that kind of leadership where it's like, when you put on this flame jersey, when you are in the Saddle Dome, when you are a representative of the Calgary Flame, what do we expect of you on and off the ice as a representative? And I don't you have really, to go back to the 80s. Yeah, and I don't think, yeah, I don't, like, when it was Poplinski and Hunter and Lanny and... And Paul Reinhardt and Joel Otto, that was when the Flames had an identity. And right now, I feel like this is, this sounds really brutal to say, but it feels like there's there's a bunch of players on this team here to collect a paycheck. I could be completely wrong by that because I'm not in the dressing room, but I'm not feeling that sense of culture and, like, and the, man, I'm really proud to wear this flaming sea on my chest and represent the Calgary Flames. I'm not feeling that at this point in time. And that's what... I feel Mike Smith is trying to drag out of this team. And I think part of that is a bunch of young guys who maybe don't know any better, right? They're following the lead of the older guys and the older guys aren't giving that. And I think that was one of the things the flames looked at with Yager was to be that veteran leadership. And I mean, we know that he left early in the season. So I think they really need to spend, like Matt said, whether it's high in the lineup or low in the lineup, you just got to get in some vets who want to win. Yep. And you, I think that oddly enough, uh, the one of the players that seems to have his head on straight is Sam Bennett, and even though he's struggling on the ice, he seems to care and want to win, and he seems to be personally angry and frustrated when this team isn't doing things the right way, and uh, he seems to have that what we're hoping that the rest of the team has even though he hasn't contributed as much as I think he or the fans would have liked. He reminds me of Doug Gilmore, in a sense. This is a guy that's going to develop a little bit later in his career like Gilmore. This is a guy that has the emotion and the tangibles. He has it. I know that like you can criticize, we can talk about this later about when he was drafted, and I know he was a higher pick, but this is a guy that's going to develop a little bit later, and I see a lot of Doug Gilmore in him. Like I see a guy that's going to be able to lead a team to some playoff success. It's not going to come early for him, but it's, it is going to happen. Yeah, and I looked at, because uh, of the Sedins, uh, his stats actually mirror Daniels uh, pretty much exactly through the yep. first few seasons. Yeah. So, it, you know. It, you Does can, he have an identical twin without a beard? It, Maybe. They interchange, you know. So Sign Stan Bennett. Stan. It's Stan Bennett. <laughs> Sam and Lamb Bennett, the two Bennett boys. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and Matt and I have talked about this before, and I've said I think Bennett sometimes gets an unfair, maybe an unfair shake because of how high he was drafted. I think people expect more from him. If he was a, let's say he was an unsigned college player, or let's say he and Goudreau swapped and he was a fourth-round pick, I don't think we'd be having some of the discussions that we've been having this year about Bennett. No. No, that's true. That's Even true. if he was like a 20th overall pick, it'd be like, oh, he's doing good. Yeah. But, you know, hopefully he can take some additional steps forward. And, you know, there's a the third line center on this team is a guy that took a long time to develop. And people forget that. And Mark Jankowski. And people were scratching their heads about that pick. People wondered a lot about that pick. And that guy is going to be a part of this team for a really long time. So it takes yeah, time. Absolutely. Well, guys, let me ask you a big question, and I'll throw this to Kevin first and then to Matt. Um, 
here in Calgary for so many years, I've been looking back and I mean, at least as long as we've been doing this podcast now for six seasons, do you think that we need to next year come into this and not say playoffs or bust, but say, you know what, this team needs to be a Western conference, uh, you know, Western conference. I wouldn't say winner, but even finalists, for the last two teams, in the Western conference to be successful. Like, I guys feel like when you say, when you need to make the playoffs and you fall a little bit short, it's like, well, okay, well, we tried, we came close. But if you say, you know what? You need to win the West, and then you don't even make the playoffs. That's when you know heads need a roll. Kevin, what do you think? Well, maybe not that far, but do we just need to look further than just make the playoffs? I do think we need to start looking further than just making the playoffs. And this is my – this is, again, my sense sitting out here. And, and you're in Vancouver for all the fires that chat listeners that don't know. Yeah, yeah. This is my sense. And but I've lived in Calgary for most of my life, so I feel I feel still qualified to kind of talk about this. And I'm not trying to get political, but we, I want to go back here. This is an ownership group that sent their lap dog, Ken King, out to beg for an arena and say, We're not going to talk about this team for the arena, blah, 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 blah. You look how much what we've done for this team or gonna city, blah, 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 blah. Praise us, we're oh Lord owners. And Really, quite frankly, you look back on the history of this team, if it's not for an accidental stick, a remarkable trade, an unlikely trade, a couple of injuries to the Vancouver Canucks, this team would not have a playoff series win in over 30 years. Really, legitimately. And a goal that could have... And a goal that could, should have actually been called back and would, if he scored it this year, it would have been called back. It was kicked in. I just don't think that the Flames owner, to, from the top, I think that there has been just this malaise is like, well, this fan base is going to be okay because we have a hockey team and we're fine. They'll come when there's no playoffs. They'll come if there's one round. There's no real expectation of this team. This team is who we are and our fan base is going to be okay with it. And I do think it's time maybe for a fan base to push back a little bit and say, look, we want to be a Stanley Cup champion. We want to be more successful than the Oilers. We want to be in a Western Conference final. We want to be a top team. We are tired of sitting in this murky, mucky muck of mediocrity that had it not been for the laughable draft history of the Edmonton Oilers, we would be laughed at as well. Right? I think that there's just, I think that there's a malaise around this team from owners on that it's like, yeah, I think that the expectations in this organization need to be higher, but I don't think the owners really, quite frankly, care because they're getting cash in their pocket. We've talked about that on our show, and I mean, we don't have to reiterate today, but for your listeners who don't know, I've said I think the biggest story next offseason, not this year, but in the 2019 offseason, will be a sale of the Calgary Flames. Matt, what do you think about this? Do you think that the Flames need to publicly, not just, you know, us fans, but the GM needs to come out and say, all right, our goal this year is, you know, Western Finals or bust, second round or bust, whatever that might be, more than just making the playoffs? It, well, they should have had the expectations this year of at least home ice advantage. And if you look at this team, if they had just played at the same level as they did for the first few months from January on, the Flames would have had home ice advantage in this division this year. So it, it's one of those situations where this was a season where everything went wrong. They need to basically come out and say, we're going to be a cup contender this upcoming season and increase the expectations. And if things don't go, then heads need to roll. And whether that's trades or managerial changes one or the other there needs to be a greater level of expectation that this team is has to start winning and frankly we're not seeing that on the ice and it's frustrating because of the fact that you can see that they have all the parts that they need they just need to get on the same page and maybe add a score but that's about it like they're they're not that far away. And especially with our division being rather average to terrible, you know, like Vegas, I don't expect to repeat as well as they have. And 
you look at San Jose, LA, and Anaheim, they're going to be starting to trend down more. Vancouver and Edmonton and Arizona are all tire fires of varying degrees. So, you know, the, the division's ours for the taking. They just have to go out and do it. And I think this season has hurt the goodwill, so to speak, from Flames as the team to the city itself because of the fact that, well, you just look at the season at on home ice. Like, there has not been many, I, I can count on one hand, the amount of exciting games as a Flames fan. And, it, it, you know, you can't sell tickets if, uh, you know, you're going to put up the efforts that they have been. Uh, you know, like, I, I'm sure that a lot of season ticket holders are, questioning whether to renew just because of the fact that uh, how do you sell tickets like you're going to basically have to give them away if they're going to play like they did this year and well and that's the big question right is if there stops being if season ticket will start jumping ship then that's where you're going to start to have a problem well and really you look at this team overall and i i would agree with matt i think on paper i don't and, you know, this is the Flames Fireside podcast, so we could be a little bit biased here, but I don't see much of a difference between them, the Ducks, the Kings, and the Sharks. I really don't. I think I think in terms of talent, I think they're they're equal, pretty much. I mean, they all have a, one little a superstar, pretty solid goaltending, and defense. I think, I don't think the Flames are that far behind the Ducks, the Kings, and the Sharks. I think the problem with this team is, is cohesiveness really uh it's I think the problems are all between their ears yes cohesiveness and in between their ears yes exactly and and confidence that has a lot to do with what happened and leadership you look at like and i'm not criticizing Giordano, but you look at a gets a thornton and a kopitar and the kings is is it's almost like it, it it just feels different i guess looking from the outside yeah, and and I think too those are teams that have had more. I mean, our piece are still pretty young, and you look at all the guys you just named, and they're veterans. And I think this team is going to get better as they age together, and as those guys get older. I mean, a lot of these guys aren't even at their peak yet, but I think we have to get our crap together next year. Or we're going to miss the peak of a lot of the good players we have. Yeah, and I guess we'll we'll get into this a little bit later, but it's one of the questions to ask. And historically, we haven't done it is do we spend that money on a big, big fish in terms of behind the bench? And I think that's a necessary thing, but we had, well, our show last week actually was all about that. While we're on that, why don't we talk about a little bit from our show last week? So for listeners that don't know, we do a weekly poll and we ask our listeners to give us their feedback. And Kevin, I don't know if you voted in our poll last week, but we asked why would who would you like to be the Flames' next head coach or the head coach next season? And some interesting results. You guys ready? Ready. Uh, Glenn Gullitson got twelve percent of the vote to come back. Forty-two percent of the vote went for Joel Quenville. Twelve percent for Alan Vino. So just as many people wanted Gullitson back as wanted Vino. Dave Tippett got eight percent. Daryl Sutter got nineteen percent, and. Other was split between two votes of either Bruce Boudreaux or Yarmer Yager, which were right in. <laughs> Man. If you want to bring Yager back, they can bring him back as a coach. Uh, why not? Yeah. Um, so, you know, and I think, Kevin, you're right. If we want to get better, and I said this last week, you can't expect to be a NHL team or an NHL, you know, champion team without an NHL champion coach. We can't start bring, keep bringing in rookie coaches and coaches that have no track record. you got to bring in a Boudreaux, a Vino, a, you know, a Quenville, a Sutter, someone who's got some knowledge of how do you actually take this, how do you take a team to the, to the finals? The problem is, well, let's, let's look at Quenville first. I think you're going to have to pay a lot. And you might have to overpay for Quenville if, you, if there's such a thing as overpaying for a coach. At you, the same time, I think if Chicago lets him go, he's going to have cash in his pocket. Yeah. Is this the most attractive place for Joel Quenville to come? I think if you look at Quenville as a guy who likes to build championship teams, I don't think you look around at many other teams, they'll need a coach and say, yeah, this is a team I can do something with. Hmm. Okay. And it's very 
structured in a similar way to the Chicago Blackhawks anyway. So you have this small star player in Gaudreau versus Kane. You have the defensive-minded center with Monaghan and Taze. So, like, there are some parallels there. Yeah. I just think if you're Quenville and you're out of a job, you're looking at what teams that want to coach would I want to go to. I think Calgary would be the most attractive. You're not going to go to Edmonton. You're not going to go to, you know, Buffalo. I think that this is one team you say, yeah, there's something I can work with here. Yeah. I mean, that would be a really great get. Um, I think the odds of it are, are like zero. Yeah, that's the problem. It's It feels like zero. It's... It, I just I was thinking about this today. I don't know if Chicago is really going to give up Quinville. I think that that would be a monumental, an error of monumental proportions if they do it. But who knows? Here's uh, a wild card. Somebody not posting our poll, but a comment that was put on Facebook is: What if the Flames bring in Willie Desjardins? God, God, no! For the love of God, no! Absolutely not. Or Ab- they bring him as an assistant. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Ugh. If you wanted, I guess. I, I'd be underwhelmed. You know, like, yeah. Okay, sure. Why not? So, I mean, Kevin, you want to talk about this. Uh, the coaches and the GMs and their job status. Do you think it's time that we clear out everyone who has coach in their title, head or assistant, and start all over again? Do you think anyone should retain their job? Well, let's look at, at what happened here with, with Gullickson. Um, and let's start there, and then we can get to, to Tree. So Gullickson last year, the turning point of last year's season was the train ride from Montreal to Toronto or Montreal to Ottawa. It was a train ride east where Gullickson said, you know what, you guys, you got to figure this out. Uh, and they did and got on the, one of the hottest streaks uh, in the league and had one of the best records late in the season to get into the playoffs. This year, a turning point was he threw his stick and started yelling at veterans and get your head out of your ass. Uh, he certainly, uh, so th- that's that. Um, for some unknown reason, for the love of God, I would I'd love to know what Troy Brower has on Glenn Gullickson because that guy has been somehow found his way on his first, second, third, fourth line. And a guy like Andrew, and I'm not saying Andrew Manjapani earned ice time, but Andrew Manjapani. Um, certainly put in more of an effort, I would argue, overall than Troy Brower and can't, couldn't get past the fourth line. Uh, there seemed to be an inconsistency with how he treated the vets to the youngsters. Uh, there seemed to be, uh, you even look back at the game in San Jose, uh, Dougie Hamilton made an inexplicable play uh, that led to that loss. Uh, Hamilton's back on the ice again. I'm not saying that Dougie Hamilton is you know, bench Dougie Hamilton all the time. But it feels to me in a long term here that there's a certain disrespect to this coach. I don't know if this team respects this coach enough. And I think the strategy around this power play for the last two seasons with Dave Cameron is it's beyond me how this has happened. So at the very least, if you're bringing Mac Gullitson, there has to be a change in assistant coaches in some way, shape, or form. There has to be either some sort of, he, you bring in a veteran coach, like with Mike Sullivan brought in Jacques Martin, someone like that that has a little bit of success that can help Gullickson. Because to me, there is there seems to be, they are not on the same page. Um, and I'll say Gullickson's better than Hartley. I will grant you that. But at the same time, they're not on the same page. Matt, you're a big Daryl Sutter fan. Do you remember when Daryl Sutter was the GM here and the Flames brought in the assistant GM of Jay Feaster and we pretty much all saw the writing on the wall that, you know what, if Daryl screws up, there's the guy who's going to replace him. If they decide to bring Gullitson back, do you think you'd do something similar? Okay, here's, like Kevin was saying, here's a veteran guy. He's here to help guide you, and if you screw up, he's going to take your job. Possible, but I don't... Uh, it, yeah, I... Uh, it would depend on who that is, and I think that, like, if... Uh, Probably tip it at this point? Yeah, and I'm not sure. It, that could very well be, but um, I think that you're more likely to see just an outright firing than going that route. Like, you, we see in New York with Vigneault, 
they brought Lindy Ruff in to be the assistant. But Vigneault's been there for a long time, and the Rangers are going from being a contender to not so much. So it makes sense in that perspective. But here, like, this season has, based on expectations, is probably the, the single worst season in Calgary Flames history. So you have to get rid of the coach at that rate. And it's not nice to see somebody get fired, but this was a debacle of monumental proportions to steal a McTavish quote. So, you know, like you have to, you it's whether it's justified or not, you have to do it. And I think at this point, saving this coach could cost tree his job. Yeah. What do you think? I agree. I, this is the question that comes down to, though. Is there a coach out there? You're going to say, yes, there is. But you have to make sure that this coach is better than Gully. Like, you have to, you absolutely have to make sure. Like, if it's a Bruce, I'll toss in a vote for Bruce Bruce Boudreaux. I know he hasn't won a playoff series. I know he's not going to win another one. But he's also employed. Well, he may not be employed after. Maybe if he's out, I would love to see him here. I think he would be a lot of fun. But I, I think you need to make sure Bonin that this coach don't need to go together. What's that? Bon and Boudreaux don't uh, need to go together. Uncle Brucey. Uh, at least he might know how to beat Anaheim. Just say it. I'm just saying. <laughs> but secrets the Honda Center. Yeah. <laughs> um, the but you have to make sure that this is a guy that's either well respected or is a better coach a hundred percent than Gullitz on that. You were like, you cannot bring in a guy that is viewed as an assistant slash project, which I think Gullitson came across as when he was hired. Well, if you look at teams that have been successful, it, usually the coach is the leader of the team. Like forget the on ice guys. Like you have leadership there, but they're the general in charge. And even when Bob Hartley was the coach with Calgary, his system was terrible. I'm not even going to argue that. But he was leading the team in a, a way. And he was very forceful. On, like, if something happened on the ice that was wrong, he would be barking at the ref, or he'd be barking at the players, or, you know, like him getting into that scuffle with Tortorella in the locker room. Like, it, he led the team. And Gullitson doesn't have that in him where I'm going to take charge of the team. Like It's just not in him. He's too nice of a guy. And it, you need somebody that is abrasive in a way. And like it doesn't need to be a, an established coach. Like You look at Mike Sullivan. He was had no prior head coaching experience, but he is very much that abrasive, you know, F U type of way. And the Penguins win two Stanley Cups. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a veteran guy like a Sutter or a Quenville or a Tippett. They just need to have the cojones basically to dictate the play off the ice and be able to show emotion on the bench when something does go wrong to actually stand up and say something and be forceful with the referee or well, if, and if we look we've got Tippett, we got blizma both unemployed who fill that that need i'm not entirely sure if i'm a big blizma fan or not Neither am I. Yeah, well, but, to if, be but if what if what you want is what matt was mentioning blizma can go nuts behind his bench we've seen that so could Jim Playfair, by the way. I think a guy who would fill that, if you want a guy without an NHL experience, is Sheldon Keefe, the uh, Marlies head coach. Yeah. But to me, you can't bring in a, another rookie head coach and say, okay, take these guys to a championship. It's like it, taking a player who's never won a Stanley Cup and said, lead us to the Cup. You need guys who've done it. Yeah. And either a, an NHL head coach or a bunch of assistants who've done it. I think you need somebody who knows how to coach this team to a Stanley Cup. And I think, you know, there's very few of those guys out there. Um, but I, I think that the Flames need to find one of them or someone who's gone at least deep in the playoffs. And you bring in a guy without that experience as the assistant, maybe grooming him to be the next head coach down the line. And I think it could even be almost like a Mike Smith situation. Bring in a guy for two years. Say, all right, you're running this ship. You new guy, watch really closely how he does it because we're not renewing his contract in two years and then you're running the ship. 
Yeah, maybe. But I think that the, the problem with that is this, I think there's so much pressure in this organization to be successful that it's not a two-year development situation. Like, we need something now. No, but I think you can bring in a guy now who might, you know, might be a good short-term fix. But, you know, he's hard on the players, like I think Hartley was, where he burns out after two years. But you've got his heir apparent in the wings instead of making a whole search for a new guy. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go on record and say I'm not a fan of bringing back Daryl Sutter. I don't think that that would work. I don't either. Um, I don't think that that, and I don't even think Dave Tippett would be a solution here. Uh, I think, um, I think that guy's a little bit overrated. I think history will look on him as, as a bit overrated. I know that he, yeah, he had a really bad talented team, but I don't know necessarily. I don't think the style that the flames want to play is a connection with Dave Tippett. I just think it's the tree Tippett relationship in my brain. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we need to get away from that a little bit. I think we need to maybe, you know, I know I understand the connection, but there may need to be some fresh eyes in this organization. Like, it would be, if if we could, a guy like Jacques Martin may not be so bad here. And he's got two other Stanley Cups. He's one of those guys, if, if you want that two-year... This is the, you know, he'll wear it out, but you could bring someone else in in terms of development. Jacques Martin could be that guy. You know, I know a lot of people think he'll stay in New York, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be opposed to Lindy Ruff being our next head coach. Yeah, he plays a run and gun style. Um, I think it's interesting. I mean, his teams haven't historically been great defensively, but, you know, it's certainly a is that, is that his coaching style or is that the GM not giving him the defense he needs? That Dallas team, well, well, that goaltending in in Dallas when he was there wasn't very good. But he did have Dominic Hasek and got to a cup final. I don't know. I think he'd be I, – I, I wouldn't mind Lindy Ruff here too. I think he'd be a, a good guy to have. I, I wouldn't be opposed. Um, and I actually wouldn't be opposed to Alain Vigneault here either. I think he'd be a good fit here. I think, uh, I think he'd be a good fit in Calgary. I think he'd bring in a lot of – uh, veteran experience. He almost got a cup. He, you know, he took that Rangers team as far as he could, considering the talent that they had. I don't. Know, I think he'd be a good fit here too. So, Kevin, you also wanted to talk about the general manager of this team, Brad for Living, and if he should keep his job. And we had a similar fan question from one of our listeners, Dan Pru, on Facebook, who said, "I'm a fan of I'm a fan of Tre Living, but how?" How about analyzing some of the moves he didn't make that affected our season, such as acquiring a proven backup goaltender? Also, moving forward, should we trade for number one pick, and who should we re-sign? So let's break this down. Um, we'll start with Kevin because it's his topic. Kevin, do you think that Troy Living should be back next year? Yeah, I did some digging in as well. Um, you look what we have this year. You've got four picks this year, four picks next year. He traded the first, the second, and the third, which is going to be a lottery pick. The second was for Brian Elliott. The first and the third, Travis Hamanick. The Mike Smith pick next year. Uh, I think you can look at the Brian Elliott trade and say, say that obviously wasn't a good trade. The Travis Hamanick trade, I, I think you can jury that a little bit. I think I think there's a lot of other things going on here. Uh, but and Hamanick didn't get off to a great start, but I'm not necessarily a non-fan of Travis Hamannick. It's easy to say Elliot didn't work because he's done and gone already, but, I mean, Hamannick's only played one year here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's given up a lot of draft picks. I will say the one thing that has improved, though, under the tree leaving reign that I think ultimately, other than, I guess you will, de- you can debate Bennett for a long time and picking him fourth, but I think a lot of teams would have picked him fourth, is the draft record overall has been pretty good. Uh and I think that that's the one good sign. I mean, his, interestingly enough, the Dougie Hamilton trade for the first round pick, the 15th pick was Zachary Sinitia. The fun fact is the 16th pick was Matthew Barzell. So that potentially could have been Hamilton for Barzell. I, but I mean, would you make that trade again, knowing what you know? I don't know. Yeah, and you got to also look at the, the Flames were scouting uh, the... Kyle Connor's team, and we signed uh, one of uh, Ryan Lumberg from his team. Uh, so it could very well have been Kyle Connor instead of Matthew Barzal. And either way, you're looking at a 
dynamite player. And I think that even then, having a first pairing defenseman is more valuable than either the forwards there. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I'm one that I would say I, I would give Tree at least another season. To I, I think. A lot of things bounced the wrong way, but I think overall um, he does have to get this coach right. I mean, you. I mean, the big criticisms would be the signing of Troy Brower, uh, the hiring of Glenn Gulletson, uh, you know, um, and, you and be- I have to jump in there with Troy Brower since he's been here under Glenn Gulletson, he has not played like Troy Brower, and he is a very physical pain in the rear end type player who is a disturber in front of the opposing net. And for whatever reason, a lot of the truculent forwards for Calgary under Gullitson have not been allowed to play a truculent style at all. And like you look at Garnett Hathaway, he, when he was playing in Stockton was a very physical player. He would at least have one hit on every shift pretty much. It, and in the NHL level, he barely touches anybody. And I think that's partially a, a thing with Gullitson is not wanting to engage physically. And I think that's part of the reason why certain players like Brower struggle so much is because that's part of their identity. And they're just not being able to do that. And I think that, like, even with Furland, he uses his uh, frame to generate space and openings, and even he's struggled at times because he hasn't been able to do that uh, as much. So you're putting that more on Gullitson than Tree? Yeah. Well, you you even look at player deployment. Like, you have TJ Brody, who's been a right defenseman his entire career. He struggled last year epically as a left defenseman and then goes back to it again this year and he struggles just as bad. And it's one of those things that it's a comfort thing. And he doesn't look comfortable playing defense on the left side. But that rigidity for that, there's just no flexibility in adapting to a player. It's the player has to adapt to the coach. And I think that's part of the reason why so many players have struggled is because they're not being able to play their own game. Well, let me ask you guys both this, and I'll start with Kevin and then go to Matt. The GM's job, arguably, is to put the right team on wearing Flames jerseys. Has If you look at the Flames roster this year, has Tree put the right players in Flames jerseys? Kevin, what do you think? I think the part of the problem this year was... And we haven't really addressed this, but this was a huge... The, the loss of Yarmer Yager was a huger loss than I think we have cared to admit. Uh, and But, I mean, if you look at Tree's job was to sign that guy and try to bring him in. He couldn't... You know, he the GM... If we're looking at the GM's performance, losing Yager is not really his issue. But no. if you look at signing Yager, all those things, do you think the GM has done his job of bringing the right guys to the Flames? I think for the most part, I would say yes. I think he has... I still think that there's a missing right shot scoring forward, but uh, overall, um, I don't, th- you know, I think he's been very patient with a guy like Jankowski, where maybe a lot of other teams would have moved him. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I would agree with Matt. I think it's been partially deployment. I think the, the guys are here. I mean, why haven't we seen Curtis Lazar at center? Like, well, but again, that's, a, that's more of a coaching issue. But, no, but you're right. But but that speaks to what Matt is saying in the sense. I do think that this team has the pieces to, I think, as I said, I think they're equal to the Kings, Ducks, and Sharks at least. It's hard to argue on paper that they're not. And that's why we all think the coach is gone. Yeah. But I mean, if, you know, and you're right, Tree's made some mistakes, but what GM hasn't made mistakes? Yeah. yeah. You know, to me, if I look at what Tree's done, I mean, it's easy to criticize some of the deals he's made or trades he's made. The biggest thing to me that this guy's done is his wizardry with signing contracts. Yeah. Like, we've got some crazy contracts that other GMs would scratch their heads and go, how the hell did you pull that deal off? Yeah. And I know that people mock Michael Backlund, but again, I'll say it. If Michael Backlund was an unrestricted free agent, 31 teams would have went for Michael Backlund. 
a hundred percent, he would have been the second most attractive free agent out there behind Tavares. No question about that. And he made, and that signing is a, was a really, it was a well constructed contract too. And he's been great at that. So Matt, let me ask you the same question I asked Kevin. Do you think that tree has done his job of bringing the right guys to the flames? By and large. Yeah. You look at the flames team as they're set up. They have four top pairing defensemen. They have, well, frankly, six top nine forwards, uh, and two of them were hurt. So they had eight, but Yager and Versteeg missed most of the season. So you know they had ever they have an all star goaltender, like they have everything that they need. It's just everything kind of that could have went wrong went wrong. Yeah, and unfortunately, the one weakness on the team was the right side, and. Two significant injuries happened to it with both Versteeg and Yager getting hurt. And in the middle of a season, you just can't replace that. And none of the prospects stepped up into the roles. And what happened, happened. And if you look at most GMs, they try to focus on kind of one thing every offseason. And, you know, I think Tree's done that. Maybe we're weak in some areas, but no team's perfect. Look at any roster on the NHL. We'll find some deficiencies. So to me, it's like, yeah, maybe we needed that, but that might have been his plan for this summer was to address the the right wing slot. Yeah. Yeah. And with the Flames having so many good young defensemen as well, and both Rasmus Anderson and Brett Kulak looking like they can use more ice time, the Flames can parlay one of those top four defensemen into a top scorer, or at least a top six scorer, and... Because everybody needs defense uh, more so than even forwards, and yeah. Calgary has that luxury of being one of the few teams with, you know, pick your poison basically, and uh, we can we can set the market on that. And there's not really too many teams that have four good defensemen. I, I few have three good defensemen. So Calgary has an opportunity to address that in a meaningful way. It's just who and how. Yeah. So let me ask you guys this question about the GM then, and I'll start with Matt and then go to Kevin this time. Our GM has made some aggressive pitches, as we mentioned. He gave up a lot for Smith. He gave up a lot for Hamannick. He gave up a lot for um, Elliot. Would you rather a GM who's willing to make those bold moves if they don't always pan out, or would you rather a guy who always makes the cautious move and maybe misses out on some of the big chances he might need to take to make his team better? Kevin, what do you think? Well, you're going to start with Matt, so I'll let oh, Matt start. Matt, go ahead. Uh, you need to have a little bit of both. And frankly, the moves that, uh, the goal with the goaltending, uh, that he thought that Elliot was going to be good and it was a good buy low opportunity. It's just that, uh, I don't think anybody expected what happened in the playoffs to happen. And if Elliot had just played okay in the playoffs, I don't think the Flames go out and get Smith. But Elliot was a tire fire in his own right, and he was horrible in that series. And he was the reason why the Flames lost that series handily. And you just can't go back to that. So it became, oh shit, we need a new goaltender, which that I don't think was on the market or on the docket for things to do. And, well, Mike Smith's available, and I know him, so let's go get somebody I know can do a jo- good job. And Smith has done a good job. It's just that the rest of the team did. And that's not on him. It's just bad luck, basically. But he has ident- correctly identified areas of need and gone out and done it. And now it, we have to see. And... Sometimes you do need to the more pragmatic wait and see approach, but you, sometimes you do need to pull the trigger. It's just that unfortunately this season every single thing has gone wrong, and there's not really much you can do about that. Kevin, what do you think? Do you think that you'd rather have the coach who's willing to make those aggressive bids, or the guy who's more conservative and maybe misses out on some of what needs to be done that way? Uh I, I agree with Matt. I think there needs to be a balance. I think what's going to be really interesting is as we go through the playoffs and we're, and we're going to watch Winnipeg do their thing, 
Because that was a team that was pr pragmatic other than the Steve Mason move, which actually didn't really work out uh, in a lot, of, because obviously they're going with Hellebuck. But the plan was to go with Steve Mason. Is do you be, and because that seems to be the team that everyone wants to model by. Um, I think, yeah, I think you need to have a little bit of guts and make the that move and time it right. And I like that. I agree with what Matt is saying. I think that, you know, Bring in focusing on certain positions in an off season and not trying to throw everything to the wind, but being strategic into what you bring, building through the draft. You've got a cupboard of stuff here that I think we can say, you know, um, this team is good. Getting people out of here that aren't necessarily a good fit, like a Barchi, uh, you know, getting fine trying. I think he is trying to focus on the people and the chemistry of this team. And he has taken a little bit, some risks. Uh, but, I, you know, I think you got to take a couple of shots. You know, I, I don't think it's necessarily like, yeah, this this was silly. Like, obviously, you were giving up a lottery pick for Travis Hammock. And, you know, that's a bit of a face palm. But, you know what? Sometimes that happens, right? And, well, yeah. as we've talked about, if you legitimately believe you're a playoff contender, yeah. those picks aren't going to be that valuable. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing to remember here is, yeah, it was a crappy season. Things went wrong. We've all agreed on that. But when you make that pick, I mean, if we were going to the third round, that first round pick looks like a reasonable trade. Yep, for sure. Yep. Um, to address Dan Prue's question here, and I'll ask you guys, he says uh, we need to analyze Tree and some of the decisions he made, such as a, acquiring a proven backup goaltender. I think he did that. I think he went out to get Eddie Lack, and that was supposed to be his proven backup again. Season didn't work out. Lack didn't work out. But I don't think you can say Tree didn't try to acquire a proven backup. What do you guys think, Matt? Yeah, I agree. And I think that with the acquisition of Lack, it was basically telling both Riddick and Gillies, hey, you have to be better than this guy to be in the NHL. And at the start of the year, I think all three of the goalies were basically in the same spot. So they deferred to the veteran guy instead of the kids. And then Lack struggled a bit, and they decided to go the other way, and Riddick stole the job. Now, and this isn't on Shree, but I, I'll ask you guys this. Did Eddie Lack come into training camp in good shape? From what I saw, he did. Okay. Because from what I was led to believe is that they were not entirely impressed with Eddie Lack, and they weren't ready to put him in at the beginning of the year. Like... I, I think that maybe what they expected of him and what was expected of him in Carolina were different. But you got to remember, I mean, Rasmus Anderson was the worst guy in shape at prospect camp for a couple of years. Mm. And look at where he's gone. So, yeah, I mean, Eddie Lack may have played himself out of a job. But on paper, when you say we need a, a veteran goalie, you don't know what shape they're in when you make the trade. You assume they're ready to go. I think Tree did his best he could to get that veteran backup. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I mean, and what Lack does with his role isn't necessarily Tree's fault. And yeah, like we said, Tree's job is to put the right guys in Flames jerseys. What happens from there is either the player or the coach. That's always the way I look yeah. at the GM's job. Yeah. And yeah. you know, I think it, by the time we realized Lack couldn't do the job, there's no veterans left. You can't go out and make another. I mean, you'd be overpaying, or you'd be you know claiming Montoya off waivers. Like I think. At that point, they did what they had to do, which was, well, let's try the young guys. So I don't think we can say Tree didn't try to bring in the veteran backup. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, Dan also asked here, should we trade for a number one pick this year? I'm, I'll start with my thoughts on this. I think that the cost of the Flames getting a number one, let's say a first round pick this year, are just going to be too high. I don't want to give up from this team what it's going to take. And again, if we're a legitimate playoff team, and we think this team's good on paper. I'm not sure what a what we're going to give up to get without making subtractions that are going to hurt us more. So to me, you say, you know what? It was a bad season. We learned our lesson. We paid the price. And next year we go out and we draft in that first round and just you know move on as though it didn't happen. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, it, it always is difficult to acquire draft picks on draft day. And any player that you're going to get a first round pick for is not a player that you want to just outright deal for a draft pick. And uh, the only reasonable way thing would be like, if you were doing like a more major deal where like, say like the flames were trading, say Dougie Hamilton 
and for that scoring forward, and they got a first round pick in that trade in addition to the player. That could happen, but I don't really see the the net, the need really. Like, yeah, it's disappointing that the Flames don't have a pick in the first three rounds, but the uh, that ship sailed, and you it's better just to focus on what you can do to make the team better. What whether that's trading a defenseman for a forward or whatever, it who cares really? Like, it. What just, do you think? What do you think, Kevin? Is the cost of acquisition worth it to get back in the first round? Uh, I think it was interesting that a number of teams traded out of the first round to get some players. I don't know if this draft then the first round is necessarily considered a high quality one. So I'm not necessarily married to first round. I think that there's an interesting opportunity here to kind of dig out some college free agents and some undrafted players and get a little bit more creative than and I think I'm, I'm going to be interested in seeing how they do that round. I, I wouldn't desperately be trying to get into the first round. I could see them trying to get into the second round, but desperately getting themselves into the first round, I'm not necessarily for, but I could see maybe a second round attempt. But first, I think even you know a young goaltender, which we have to move, is almost a ticket back in the second round by itself. Yeah, yeah. But I think there's some there's some college free agents out there, and there's some guys out there that I think may be under the wire that I would I think the Flames may be taking a look at, and it might be might be interesting. Who knows? Yeah, I think that the Flames will end up walking away with seven players from the draft, like it, and the period after that, but getting them via free agency rather than, you know, like anybody who's not drafted who they think highly of that might work or maybe a Euro free agent or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm seeing some creativity that's a little bit more unconventional, but. Well, and the last part of Dan's question, we'll ask, we'll answer half of this this week and half of this next week is, who should we re-sign? So Matt and I have a little bit of a game here that we play, Kevin. We'd be happy to bring you in. Sure. Uh, usually at the end of the year, we look at who do we re-sign for restricted free agents and then free agents. And we thought we'd start with the restricted free agents this year. Okay. So why don't I go through this list and uh, you guys tell me what you think. Okay. The first guy, no particular order, is one of the newest Flames, Nick Shore. He's a 25-year-old center. Matt, would you bring Shore back? Definitely. I've always liked him as a king, and I'm looking forward to him getting regular ice time next year with Calgary. Yeah, I think he takes Cajun's job. What do you think, Kevin? Yeah, I think he. I think yes. I think you bring him back, hundred percent. That's another one of those little underrated moves that Tree made. But yeah, he's a guy you bring and back. He, and again, for the price we paid, I think it'll be worth it in the end. Yeah. Here's one I think we'll all just say yes to right away. Mark Jankowski. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody disagree? If they can't find a way to bring Janko back, they've done something wrong. Yeah. Uh, Matt, a guy next on the list is a guy that I know Matt's been high on for a while. I've sort of lost my Same taste here. for over the last year, and that's Garnet Hathaway. I think Garnet has dipped quite a bit. I think he's probably got an AHL career, but I think that I would try other guys in that NHL spot. I don't think I'd. Maybe you, you bring him back as an RFA, but you don't give him an NHL job. I could see them qualifying him for Stockton, but I don't think he's on the NHL roster. Yeah, I would sign him to a two-way if you can. Uh, I can't believe he went so long without scoring. Uh, but I mean, I, that's not his job, but he, just, he hasn't even played with the intensity that he should be. Yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah I would, wouldn't be surprised if they don't bring him back. I think that also depends on who the coach is, too, and what they can bring out of him. But uh, yeah, I think he'd be a good veteran guy for Stockton. Yeah, yeah. Same here. And maybe you challenge him. Say, you know, you lost your job, play your way back. You've done yeah. it once, do it again. Yeah. But I think he could be the next Josh Juris, where he gets he just jumps around from team to team and – you know, he's in somebody's bottom six every year, but we're not really sure where he is or what he's doing. Yep. Uh, Brett Kulak. Kevin, what do you think? Do we bring Kulak back? I would. I don't know if he is quite ready for top four. I think he's a bit too inconsistent, but I would bring him back. He's uh, cheap for a top yeah, six. Yeah. I think, yeah, cheap for top six. I don't think, yeah, I would bring him, I would bring him back for top six. I I don't, but I don't know if he's ready for top four quite yet. But I, I would bring to, him back. 
I think the uh, sixth defensive spot is going to be Kulak's to lose. I could see Anderson jumping over him and Kulak becoming the number seven. Matt, what do you think? I think Kulak will be back, and I think he has more than what he has shown at the NHL level. I'm not sure if he'll be a top four defenseman at any point, but I think that there's more there. I just, he has to... Somebody's got to be bottom two, right? Yeah, and the Flames are deep enough where having him on the bottom pairing is fine. I just, uh, I think there's more to him and that he can take another step forward, but he just needs another full season. So, and I'm looking forward to him being there. I hope that he does seize an opportunity because he does have four guys that are nipping at his heels. Let's move on to probably the two that are going to be, I think we'd both say one of them comes back, but the question is which one? John Gillies and David Riddick, both of our AHL goalies have their contracts up. Uh, Kevin, what do you think happened with Gillies and Riddick? I do think they're going to bring uh, both of them. I think they're going to qualify both of them, but I do see Gillies not lasting the season here. I do see him as a trade chip. And I think one of them stays, one of them goes. And whichever, it just depends on what you're getting. The Flames have a tendency to really like their guys they've drafted. And for that reason, I can see them keeping Gillies around. I think Gillies has a higher ceiling as well. And I'm not sure how willing they are to deal him, especially with how much Tyler Parsons has struggled this year, that I'm sure that they're kind of being a little more reticent with him just because of that. Um, if, if I was the Flames, I'd qualify both. I'd move Riddick this year. Yeah. I'd hand this for another year to see what you've got in Parsons. And I think Gillies will still have great value. I think he'll be the backup next year. And I think he'll have even more value after a full year in the NHL. Yeah, it could be. I, yeah, I agree. And I think that eventually Gillies and Parsons would be a, the NHL duo, like it, say like two years from now. Um, go from there and basically sort of like Anaheim where they add Anderson and Gibson let them duke it out whoever wins wins and move on from the other guy and whoever wins is your long-term starter and I think that I don't see there being much of a rush to move a goalie one of those two goalies right away I think that they're gonna get less overall value if they move one of them sooner than later Next guy on the list, I think we'd probably all agree it's time for him to go. He didn't play at all this season because of a knee injury, and that's Daniel Preble. Yeah. Uh, well, hey, got us Riddick, so that was worth it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, he served his place. It's like Bardkowski had a role, and he served it, and now I think it's time to move on. Um, I think that if you look at you know forwards in, in, in Stockton, I think that he's easily replaceable in that role, and I don't think he's NHL ready, so where do you put him? Yeah, that bring him. I would not suspect he'll be back. Uh, the next guy on the list, the guy I was high on when we signed him, and I've sort of, I wouldn't say I've soured on him, but he's not developing the way I expect him to, and that's Hunter Shinkarik, who we brought in from Vancouver. I still think Hunter has bottom six potential. I don't think there's any reason not to qualify him at this point and give him at least another, uh, you know, another couple years here. Matt, what do you think? Yeah, I'd like to see all of the first round picks from 2013 back, whether that's Lazar, and Carrick, Klimchuk or Poirier. It's just a, you have to hope that one of these guys actually steps up and actually earns a job. And thus far they where we've been giving opportunities left, right and center to players all season. And none of them have stepped up to take one. And it's getting to the point where, you walk away, but I think one more season for each is valid, and beyond that, walk away. And you got to remember that the AHL teams do need some veteran depth too. And this is the kind of guy I could see, you know, yeah. staying in the NHL or in the organization for a couple of years just to be, uh, you know, an AHL depth guy. Kevin, what yeah. do you think? Yeah, I guess so. I'm I haven't been too high on Shin Carrick, but I guess I can see why you would put him put him there. Yeah, I he's not doing anything bad. He got 30 points this year, but he's not excelling. Yeah. I think it's hard to walk away from a 30-point AHL guy for no reason. Yeah. 
Uh, again, maybe not to miss 30 points. You don't want to miss at the HL level next year. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, it's good to have that veteran. And I think it, it's one of those guys that can push a guy like Garnet Hathaway, I think, and at the very least bring him in for competition. For sure. Uh, the next two guys, Matt said he wanted to bring back as well, and that's Morgan Klimchuk and Emil Poirier. Kevin, what do you think of those two? I liked Klimchuk's game when he was here against Boston. I didn't mind him. Uh, I think he's a guy I would like to see get another chance. Uh, and Poirier, remember he he's been he's had some injury issues, so I think just I think he also he does some personal demons as well. Uh, yeah, he's had a lot to deal with, so. Um, I mean, look, they, they were patient with Michael Furlan. I think that you can be patient with a Poirier. So I would, I would bring him back too. Poirier is a guy like Gillies who really lost, I think, you know, probably a productive year because of his substance problems last season. Um, but you know, again, he's got 22 points in 59 games. I still think of, of these three of him, uh, Shin Carrick and Klimchuk. I think Poirier is probably the guy in my eyes who's most likely to be a bottom six depth guy. Matt, what do you think? Uh, I'd have to disagree with you there. I think that Morgan Klimchuk will be out of all three of them. I think the only NHLer long term is Klimchuk. Yeah, I think I like Klimchuk more. I think yeah, I I liked what I saw of Klimchuk. Um, I'm not, I think the, the third of the three of those three, I would say Shin Carrick and I would give a second shot to Poirier, but I think, Clint, yeah, I'd rank him that way as well. And the last guy on the list who I'm sort of 50, 50 on is Hunter Smith. He's 22 big boy, six foot seven played in Kansas this year, uh, in the ECHL and he's on the injury reserve as of January, but he got 17 points uh, in the ECHL. I don't know. This guy to me hasn't really developed the way we expect him to. He's a big body, but I don't see any need to bring this guy back. And I think, you know, he's 22. I think we know what we've got out of him now. I think he could be a good AHL signing, but I'm not sure I would use one of the 50 contracts on him. What do you think, Matt? It was a horrible pick at the time, and uh, he's developed pretty much... As expected, I, I was bewildered that the Flames selected him. And, yeah, it is what it is. It, He's a nice guy, but we're not here to collect nice guys. Yeah. Oh, you no. Know, Hunter Smith is one of my favorite prospects that we've ever spoken to because he's just a genuinely decent guy. It's just that doesn't matter when you're talking professional hockey. Like, it, he, it's... Yeah, he just didn't develop at all, and he was a player that if you're using a sixth-round pick on, hey, who cares? Awesome. But a second-round pick, that was just beyond stupid back in 2014. And especially, Kevin, when, especially when the next pick was Brandon Montour. And it's oh. like, uh, you know. oh. Kevin, oh. would, you, would you shed a tear if Smith... Wasn't in the no, no, I, w- I would, I, I, I do feel bad because I mean the guy had a really inspiring story and all of that, and you know it's it's heartwarming. But you know maybe maybe another team will give him another shot, and it just maybe doesn't work in, in the Flames. Sometimes that happens. I would love to see him get another shot somewhere, but it's not a fit here, and that's okay. It's you know Smith has a passion for this game. I can honestly see him either being a uh, career ECHL or going and making something of himself in Europe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think he's Euro bound personally, yeah. and that would be good for him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just as a quick reminder, so those are our RFAs. Um, next week, Matt and I will do the UFAs and talk about who we'd keep and who we wouldn't. But those are our RFAs. So I think you know, pretty strong group overall, and for a Flames team who's got a lot of young depth, especially a lot of young defensive depth. I think that it's good that we bring back some of these veteran forwards, at least until some of the new guys coming in, like uh, Dubé, like uh, Phillips, can get their AHL footing under them. And that's when I think you make a real decision about Shin Kara, Klimchuk, Poirier, those kind of guys. Yeah. And you also got the, I mean, there's an interesting story. I mean, we, we could talk in a future time, but the Glenn Gahan story, I think, going forward is also going to be a very interesting story where, where this guy, if this guy turns out or not. I mean, he's certainly lighting it up right now, but we'll we'll have to see. Yeah, I'm a little concerned about Gunn's turn to pro, but we'll see what happens there. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things that very smart players tend to do well in juniors, but uh, does the player's skill 
translate. And Gauden and is a very smart, smart players player. Overthink the HL as well. Yeah. So yeah, we'll have to wait and see. I think by the thirty game mark next year, you'll know what Gauden is. Yeah. It's I, just yeah, yeah, I agree. You have to wait and see. There's been a lot of guys who we would look at as smart junior players, and they come to the HL. And they're always a step behind because they're waiting for the set player. They're waiting for the guy to do what they think they're going to do, and they're not able to react. And I think in pro hockey, one of the biggest things is how do you react under pressure? Yeah. Yeah. We'll see about that for sure. Uh, Well, while we're talking about juniors, just a note, we won't uh, get into it unless anyone wants to chat about this, but two of the Flames prospect, Dylan Dubé and D'Artagnan Jolie, still I think the best name in hockey, their CHL seasons are over, and they've joined the Stockton Heat. So D'Artagnan's on an amateur tryout agreement, and Dylan is signed uh, to the Flames and and then recalled there. So uh, good to see these guys. Hopefully they'll get a couple preseason or playoff games. And, uh, you know, I think the more you can be around the pro team, the better off you're going to be, especially for Dylan, who's going to transition to the program next year. Yep. We have to look at the uh, draft rankings this year to see if there's an Aramis or a Porthos or, you know, <laughs> to go with D'Artagnan. Don't take the best players. Take the best names. Take the best names. Um, There's been some good NHL names. I think if D'Artagnan Jolie makes the NHL, he might go on that list. Yeah. I like that name. Here on Fireside Chat, we're doing a new thing. We're inviting our fans to interact with us, as always, through social media. Or you can call or text us. If you call, you'll leave a voicemail. But we want to know what you think about what we've talked about, maybe who you want the coach to be, or which RFAs you think should stick around. So you can get a hold of us. Our phone number is 587-200-7176. And like I said, read, leave us a text or give us a phone call, and hopefully we'll be able to play or read your stuff on the show next week. Yeah, I don't have that capacity on my show, but you can always – love you. With, that's it all. Uh, follow me, Facebook, Kevin Olenek. Uh, like, agree, or disagree the podcast on Facebook. Follow me, K-A-V-O-L-E, on Twitter, Instagram, Spreaker, Podbean, uh, K B O L E Patreon as well. Uh, but uh, I do more polls and stuff. I get your feedback that way. Uh, I don't, maybe I just don't want your text. No, but maybe one day we'll get into, we'll do that one day. Well, that's not my number. So it's not like I get their text when I'm walking around. There's a special phone stuck in the studio. Oh, sweet. Oh, well, that's an interesting way to do it. It's just for Fireside Chat. It's like, remember in the 60s, Batman, they had the special phone. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, it's the Fireside phone. That's right. We need the, the red flashing phone when people call in. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then we need the fireside signal, too, so we know where yeah. to go answer them. But yes. Yeah. Well, speaking of polls, we have a weekly poll that we do every week, and I invite our listeners or Kevin, if your listeners want to participate, too, we'd love to have their feedback. Sure. Um, we always ask a topical question that we want your feedback on, and you can answer the poll in one of three ways. You can go to firesidechat.ca. It'll be right on the homepage. Or you can find us on Facebook where Fireside Chat or Facebook.com slash Fireside Chat or on Twitter where at Fireside Podcast. And we'll post links from there as well. But based on what we talked about this week, we want to know do you think Brad Trilliving should come back as Flames GM next year? So we have four options yes, no, undecided, or couldn't care less. Uh, let us know what you think and we will read the results on the show next week. That's an interesting little question. Yeah. Say we may know by Monday. Yeah, we might. I, I think that your GM will last a little bit longer, but we'll we'll see what happens. We could know by Monday for sure, which is when we record next. Yes. Yeah. And then the way we always finish off our show is with a look ahead to the next week for the Flames, and this is the last one we'll be doing for the 2017-2018 season as we look at the last three games for this team. And, Kevin, if you want to play our little game this week, you're welcome to. We always try to predict the results for the week. Okay. So this week, the three games the Flames have is Tuesday night at the Dome, 7 p.m. against Arizona. Then Thursday, they make a quick trip to Winnipeg for 6 p.m. start time against the Jets. And then they finish the season on Saturday back at the Dome against the Vegas Golden Knights in 8 p.m. start time. So we usually start with Matt. Matt, what do you think? Uh, Zeros across the board. I think they're just going to fade quietly into the night. Kevin, what do you think? I think I pick a win against Arizona, although Arizona has been really hot. I think um, Calgary will win that one. Uh, I think a loss against Winnipeg. And I think they're going to beat the Golden Knights. I just, no, I'm going to go with the Golden Knights. I say one and two this week. 
I think that just the way Calgary's been playing, they're going to lose to the Coyotes because that's what they do. I think they'll beat Winnipeg because I think Winnipeg's going to start shutting down some of the guys they normally otherwise wouldn't have. Yeah. And I think they'll probably lose to Vegas because, well, that's the way the season's going. So I'm going to give them the win on the road. Plus, they seem to play better on the road anyways. Yeah. Yeah, they do. That's uh, for some unknown reason they do this year. Do either of you guys think Oliver Shillington plays this week? It got recalled on an emergency basis. I hope so, but I doubt it. Stone's wife just had babies this week, so I could see them giving him a game or two off. Yeah, I would. I hope so too, but um, maybe, you know, um, I hope so. At what point do you slip some in Barkowski's drinks that he's six or something? Chilling thing to play. I uh, uh, you, you drink from that blue water bottle, only that one. Okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just drink from there. Poor Matt. Well, guys, anything else you want to talk about? I think we're good for this week. I think we had a good conversation. Yep. All right. Well, let's sign off then. As always, uh, Dan and Matter sign off for Fireside Chat. And Kevin, how do you usually sign off your show? Uh, thanks for joining, and we will talk to you all soon. Bye for now. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.